together to open up your word. Father God, that, that is what it is. It's your word. And so we ask that you would guide us, that you would direct us, Lord, that you would allow me to step out of myself and into your Holy Spirit, that you would be our guiding force today. Father God, we love you. We praise you in your holy name. Amen. Paul tells us in Romans not to be conformed by the world, but to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. And we just want to draw your attention one more time to uh, the insert for the next series here in two weeks. We're going to be starting the series Transformed. And uh, so we really just want, this is, this is a great uh, opportunity to invite somebody with this card. We're also going to make the video that you just watched. We're going to make that available on Facebook. So if you want to share that with somebody on Facebook as an invite, we want to make that available as well. This morning, we're continuing in our series, The Balancing Act. And we've been talking about just how we balance our normal day-to-day -day physical life. It's also important for us to balance our spiritual life as well. And I believe that Genesis 2-7 reveals to us why this is so. Genesis 2-7 says this, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. So we get this idea here in Scripture that God takes dust, forms man, and then whoo, breathes in man the breath of life, and Adam comes to life. It's how we we're made. If we had an ingredient list, there'd only be two ingredients, dust and the breath of God. So we are literally one part of the world and one part divine. And these two parts of who we are, these are the two parts that we are attempting to balance. In Romans 7, Paul describes it as a war between our flesh and our spirit. He says, I'm, I'm doing the things I don't want to do, and I'm not doing the good that I do want to do. And our job is, is the same as, as, as what Paul was struggling here, is to find the balance between the two things that make us who we are, dealing with our humanity, but at the same time acknowledging our divinity. And I think that we can do two things. We can focus too much on the dust, and we're going to call this the Eeyore effect. So this is the, the everything is terrible, the sky is falling. You know, whatever, whatever it is, I'm worthless, I'm no good, I'm just dust. Or we can do the opposite, where we focus too much on the divine, and like Satan, we, we seek to be God ourselves. So we're, we're finding this balance between dust and divinity, arrogance and pity. And I think the key here is that we have to learn to be both. The process of learning to be confidently humble. Confident in who we are, that we are children of God, but humble of who we can be, kind of our disposition to sin. But I believe that we can learn to be confidently humble by doing a few things. The first one of those things is we can learn to be steadfast. James 1, 2 through 4 says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Some of your translations might, instead of the word steadfast, might use the word endurance which might be a better understanding, but I, I think with the word steadfast, there's, there's so much more than just endurance. It's also loyalty. Loyalty and being loyal to God. So you know, regardless of how I feel, regardless of how things are going on in my life, I'm remaining loyal to God because I'm trusting and believing that he's going to pull through for me. I'm trusting and believing that he's got me covered. But I think it's also being and having fortitude, which is just strength of mind. So we're not just attacked physically, but we're also attacked mentally. So being steadfast is, is something that's, that's our whole body of enduring and being loyal. 
And that this idea of being steadfast, and maybe it's just the word endurance, it just makes me think of long distance running. I've recently started to, to get into running. Uh, one, because my brother works for Garmin and he gave me a free watch. And it does all these cool things, and so it, it motivates me a little bit. But also, I, I'm really cheap. And if you don't believe me, you can ask my wife. I just, I just for life of me, I just, I can't reconcile spending money on, on a gym membership. Because believe me, I would rather lift weights. Uh, but I've just, I've just begun to really, really like running. And since I've been running, I've, I've kind of been developing a new understanding of what endurance means. And this morning, as we look through what it means to be steadfast I, and what it means to have endurance, what does that look like in our lives? What, what does it mean to have endurance in our spiritual life? What does it mean for us to truly be steadfast? And I believe that in James 1, he gives us some answers. One of the things that I've, I've noticed while I've been running is that the weather really affects my running. Uh, so if it's super hot outside, if it's really, really hot, it affects my heart rate, it affects my stamina, uh, it affects my endurance. Uh, I went for a run a couple weeks ago when it was hotter than fire outside, and I got a mile. I normally try to go four. I got a mile, and I looked at my watch, and I said, if I don't quit running, I'm going to die. Um, and my heart rate is like bleeping on here like, hey, you can't handle this much longer. Uh, but the heat affected me. And so I, I have to turn the phrase from our youth here. When they get angry, they use the term, I'm heated. And I think that this is what James is trying to tell us here in Scripture. He says that I want you to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Because anger does not produce the righteousness of God. So if you get heated, if you get angry, it affects your ability to remain steadfast. You cannot let your anger get the best of you. And I think what we have to do is we have to come to an understanding that anger is not going to solve the problem. In fact, a lot of times it makes the problem worse or it just creates new problems. The other thing that I've been learning is that, man, what I eat really affects my run. I don't know about you guys, but I love pancakes. Pancakes are delicious. And I try not to eat them all the time because they're not great for you. But then we got things like IHOP, that free pancake day. What are you supposed to do with that? You get it? It's free, and they're pancakes. So what I do is sometimes I try to, like, I'll, I'll blend up some spinach and pour it in my pancake mix to make me feel better about what I'm eating. But it's still pancakes. And every, seriously, every time I go for a run after I've eaten pancakes, I feel like I'm going to die within 10 minutes of the run. And my stomach starts to cramp up. I just feel terrible. Like, I've really noticed that if, if I don't eat healthy, man, I can't run as well and as far as if I ate healthy. And I think that that's what James is telling us here in James 1, too. He's saying, don't be lured away and enticed by your own evil desire. Make sure to throw away all filthiness, all wickedness, and try your best to remain unstained from the world. So my question for us is, how are we fueling our lives? What, what material are we letting in our hearts and mind, and how is it affecting your life? Uh, as I've grown spiritually, I've kind of set up some different standards for uh, how I decide whether or not I'm going to watch a movie. So I'm, I'm really particular, and there's this website called kidsinmind.com, and I'll go on that website, and it tells you everything that's in the movie. And so if it's got nudity, I don't watch it. And if it's got too many of a, a particular cuss word, I don't, I don't want to watch it. Why? Because those things get in your mind. Like, and even I have the discipline not to cuss, but when I fill my mind with those movies and I'm hearing it over and over again, I'm thinking it in my head, and I, I don't want to think it. I don't want to fuel my life that way. So I'm really careful, and I, I set boundaries in my life to, to make sure that I'm not con continuing to fuel myself with junk and junk and junk. It's the same in our truth. If, if we eat nothing but junk, we end up feeling like junk. Next thing that, that I realized is that when I, when I started running, I really had to change my mindset. And I don't know if this is because I grew up playing football, but when you play football, 
every time you do something wrong, the punishment is running. So, I mean, literally, every time you do something wrong, it's like, okay, you go run laps. So when I started running, I just felt like I was being punished. Like there was just this thing like, man, what did I do wrong today? Why am I running? I mean, I, I really felt that. And so I had, to, I had to change my mindset. And what I figured out is, is the more that I ran, the, the more it, it got a little bit, it didn't get a whole lot easier, but it got a little bit easier. And I really started to enjoy what I was doing. And the more that I was enjoying what I was doing, I was doing it more and more. As I began to love running, it motivated me to get off the couch. And so that's what, that, that's what I, want, I think James is trying to tell us here. And, and one, to be steadfast is to be somebody that is truly religious. And true religion, religion that is pleasing to God, is all about caring for people. It's all about loving people. It's all about serving the people around us. It's about being people of compassion. And compassion is, is just love that stirs us into action. We see something and we say, I cannot sit here any longer and continue to let that happen. I have to do something about it. So it's that love that's in us that causes us to go out and do to be is your love for people causing you to serve i'm also learning that like today i can't just get up here and talk about running i can't go home and put on my running outfit and just walk around the house and feel good you have to actually get out of the house and you have to go do it you have to actually go running james tells us here this is the same thing don't just be hearers of the word. Be doers of the word. That is how our faith is made complete. Going to church, listening to Christian music and Christian podcasts and reading the Bible, these are all good things, but if they never change us, what's the point? We're wasting our time. We have to actively and intentionally seek to apply the Word of God in our lives. But I think the most difficult lesson that I've learned while I've been picking up running is that, man, you just have to push through. You can never give up. It's learning to fall forward and pushing through those hard runs. Because I know there's sometimes I get at mile two and I'm just like, man, I'd really like to give up. But I know that if I give up right now, it's going to be that much harder the next time I run. So I've got I to gotta push through. I've got to fall forward. Philippians 3, it's in your outline if you want to read along. Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says this, Not that I have already obtained this or that I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting my past, forgetting what lies behind, I strain forward for what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Wherever you are, no matter how it feels, we have to stay steadfast. We got to keep our endurance up. Keep pressing forward, choosing to be loyal to God, knowing that God in return is going to be loyal to us. When we endure our dust, when we endure our trials and temptations, we begin to build this confidence in God and we can remain humble as we press on because as you know, life isn't easy. But don't let your dust cripple you. Let it define you. Let it build you up. Press forward through it. Learn to be steadfast and you will become confident and humble at the same time. Another thing that we can do to learn to be confidently humble is by learning to be dependent. When I was in high school, I worked at Chick-fil-A, and I worked in the back as a cook. And there was a girl that worked with me. Her name was Sal. And Sal was like this tall. She was really, really short. And so there'd be times she would get like super, super angry at me if I would try to help her. And I never understood this. But she, she just wanted to prove to the world that she could do it on her own, that she was this independent woman and she didn't need no help. And so uh, we'd be sitting there and I would need more flour or she would need more flour and this is all I got to do. That simple. 
But instead of asking me to do that, she would go to the back, get a little step stool, bring it all the way to the front, climb up, pull it down, take the ladder all the way back, put it away, then come back. All of that time wasted. Why? To, to prove what? There wasn't a second of doubt that I had that she wasn't capable of doing that on her own. And all she had to do was ask me. I could have easily done it for her. Easily. we got to be careful because we, we're living in a culture where independence is glorified. And I'm not saying that independence is always a bad thing, but I think sometimes we take it too far. And unfortunately, we let that cultural mindset, that, that cultural mentality to begin to slip into our spiritual life as well. But we've got to stay alert to the isolation of independence because isolation in our spiritual life is not good. We must keep ourselves alert to the arrogance of independence because we start to act like we don't need God. We start to act like we don't need his community. And because of that, how often do we end up just doing our own thing? How often do we wake up and we leave the Bible untouched at our nightstand or we convince ourselves, oh, I'll, I'll get time to pray later. How often do our actions communicate to God, I don't need you, God. And I know that all of you sitting here today, including myself, I believe in my heart of hearts that I need God, but there are some times that I don't act like it. I got a feeling I'm, I'm probably not the only one. This is what Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. In other words, depend on God. Don't get caught up in the arrogance of prayerlessness. Don't let your Bible collect dust. Trust him. He's just a tad bit smarter than you are. I'm kidding. He's a lot smarter than we are. We need to humbly depend on him, but also be confident at what he can do through us. And I don't think that, that we just need to be dependent on God. I think we also need to be dependent on his community. Hebrews 10 says this, 24 and 25, let us consider how to inspire one another to greater love and to righteous deeds, not forgetting to gather as community as some have forgotten, but encouraging each other, especially because the day of his return approaches. God has designed for us to work together as one body. That means we got to stick close together. we got to rely on one another. we got to lean on one another, use one another. We've all been spiritually gifted, and God wants to use those spiritual gifts in us to help each other out. You can think about all of the, the greats that play team sports. Michael Jordan, Wayne Gretzky, this one's for you guys, Tom Brady. All these people that are considered greats, what good would they have ever done if they didn't have the team around them? Michael Jordan is great, but he could not have defeated five people by himself. It's a team sport for a reason. We need the people around us. And not only that, but you have to keep in mind, even if you convince yourself you don't need people, there are people that need you, need what you have, need what you can offer. Humbly depend on him. Be confident in what he can do through you, not only with God, but with his community. The other thing that we can do is we can learn to be confidently humble by learning to be royalty. Now, today I want to show you a clip from one of my favorite movies of all time, and this might be my favorite scene. Uh, so if you would watch. That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No. Look hard. You see? 
see. He lives in you. You have forgotten who you are, and so have forgotten me. Is that, is that not exactly what happens to us? Is that not exactly what happened to Israel over and over and over again? They forgot who they were. They had forgotten what God had done in the past, and so they forgot God and began to live their lives as they saw fit. And it had devastating effects. When you forget about your father, the king, you forget that you're a prince. You forget that you're a princess. And when you forget that you're royalty, you stop acting like royalty. You become less and less like the king and more and more like the rest of the world. But I believe as God cried out for his people through the prophet Isaiah, he does so for us today. I want to read to you Isaiah 62, 1 through 4. For your sake, I, Jesus, will not be silent. For your sake, I will not rest until you are a bright light of hope because you've been made right before God. Until your salvation is like a consuming fire, a righteous fire that will be seen by every nation and every king, you will no longer be bound to who you used to be. For you will be a diamond in the hand of the Lord. Yes, a royal crown in the hands of God. You will no longer be abandoned no longer forsaken, no longer neglected. You will no longer will your life be desolate or wasted, for you shall be called my good pleasure. For the Lord delights in you and in my kingdom, as my prince, as my princess, you will dwell. A royal crown in my hands, no longer abandoned, no longer forsaken. The God of the universe is proclaiming ahead of time through his prophet that Jesus is coming. And he's coming to remind everyone who you are. You are my son. You are my daughter. To humble us, to see our need for the king, but at the same time to bring us confidence in knowing that we are princes and princesses of a God most high. And not only to do that, not only to claim us as his own, but to tell us you no longer have to be bound to who you used to be. When I was in high school at some point, in some class, probably anatomy, they made me watch one of those videos of some woman giving birth and it was one of the most horrific experiences in my entire life. Um, it just wasn't good. Hopefully you guys, I don't know if they make you do that still today. So when it came time, when Stephanie got pregnant, I said, listen, Steph, I love you, but I'm not real sure I can watch this. I just, I just don't know if I can. This, I, it's just being honest. But when the time came... And things were happening, man, I was locked in and I watched every single moment and it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen in my entire life. You know what was different this time? This time it was my baby. This time it was my little girl. And when she came out, I couldn't wait to hold her and she was a nasty mess. <laughs> but you know what? I didn't care because it was my girl. And I didn't see the mess, I just saw her. 
Don't you understand that that's your story? Don't you understand that God doesn't see the dirt? He doesn't see the dust. He sees you. He sees who you are, the child that you are. And he loves you. Remember who you are. You are dirty, but you are also divine. You are his son. You are his daughter. That means the world to him. Let me pray for us this morning. Father God, thank you so much for your truth and your word. Father God, I just pray that you would just help us to process this, Lord. Sometimes it is hard finding that balance, Lord, because of these two things that we're made of. But Lord, we just ask that you would give us the endurance to stay steadfast that you would help us to apply that to our life, Father God, that you would just help us to be dependent on one another. Lord, and that above all, you would never let us forget that we are royalty. And then as royalty, there's a certain way that you've called us to live, to be more like you, to be people of compassion, to be people that serve. So, Father God, we just ask that you would come. We ask that you would deal with our hearts, that you would meet us where we are, that you would draw us ever closer to you, that you would help us to never forget who we are, that you created us, that we are not mistakes, that you have a plan for us, that you want to work through us. Meet us where we are today, Father. I comfort those. Challenge those that need to be challenged. Hear our hearts. Hear our cries. Hear our hopes. Hear our dreams. Help us to deal with our dust. But cling to our divinity. We love you. We praise you in your holy name. Amen. Right now, I'm just going to ask the ushers if they would prepare to serve us. They're going to serve us communion today. And um, if you have not been here as a part of our church, we just want you to let you know that uh, we practice open communion. So if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you uh, to take communion with us this morning. Uh, as they pass it out, you're going to get two cups. On the bottom cup is going to be your bread, and on the top cup is going to be your juice. If you would just hold that as Rachel sings. Uh, At the end, we'll pray and we'll take that together as community and family. with me. I will change.
And Jesus met in the upper room with his disciples. He took the elements and he blessed them. Father God, thank you so much for what we hold in our hands today. Lord, though it be just bread and juice, Father God, they are a symbol and a remembrance of something pretty incredible that happened. Lord, they are the symbols of your body that was broken, of your blood that was shed for us so that this life wouldn't have to be the end. Lord, but we also, as we hold these elements, Lord, just ask that you would help us to remember the calling on our life to follow you, to carry our own cross. So, Lord, as we take these, Lord, we just ask that you would give us the strength, your strength. Lord, that you would give us your power with the purpose of being a blessing to all those around us. The purpose of being able to leave this place and to love people. Love the people that we can't love on our own. Love the people that are hard to love. Have compassion for people like we've never had compassion before. All because of your blood. All because of your body. All because of you in us. Give us the endurance to stay obedient, to stay plugged into you, to be dependent, to remember who we are, and to remember what you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father God. In your holy name. Amen. I'm not 100% sure that you know or understand um, just how blessed we as a staff are uh, that you guys decide to, to come as much as you do and, and be here. And so we're just so thankful for you and, and all that you are. And, and if, if you're new or nearly new, we're thankful for you as well. In fact, I'd love a chance to meet you. I'll be at the Welcome Center. Uh, just thank you so much. We just ask that as you go today, go with God, be encouraged. Uh, you are dismissed. Thank you for being here. No matter what I face, your body.